A very warm welcome to everyone who has joined us today. My name is Minoush Shafiq and I'm the director of the London School of Economics and Political Science. And today we're celebrating a very important moment in history, the history of the LGBTQ plus community, but also a very important moment in the history of LSE. It was 50 years ago in October 1970 that the UK Gay Liberation Front held its first meeting in a classroom on the LSE campus. And as many of you know, GLF was formed, instigated by LSE students who'd witnessed how effective movements were in the US at, at addressing issues of gay liberation. In a very short time from that first initial meeting in an LSE classroom, the GLF was then hosting meetings with hundreds of participants, undertaking direct action to shake up the status quo and doing its bit to achieve a more inclusive society. We marked the anniversary of the GLF earlier this year with an exhibition at the LSE Library, drawing on materials from the Hall Carpenter Archive, which we hold. And I'm pleased we've been able to put together tonight's event to further commemorate the anniversary. And I'm particularly grateful to Angela and Jeffrey, who were involved in the GLF from the very beginning and who have both have close links to the school. And I think we'll be talking a little bit about that later in this event. And very grateful that you've agreed to take part. This is a very difficult time. Uh, we had hoped to hold this event in person, but of course with COVID uh, that has become complicated. And it feels a bit of a time when all we hear is bad news. Um, I think it's important at times like this to remember how much we have achieved. In 50 years, uh, LGBTQ plus rights are now enshrined in law. Gay marriage is completely accepted in society. Pride flags fly on top of every major institution in the country regularly, including the LSE. And so I, it is, this is a very good moment to remind ourselves how much we've achieved and how important that initial work by the GLF was in these achievements. I'm particularly proud of the fact that I think the LSE is one of the best institutions for the LGBTQ plus community to study and work in. And that was recognized uh, by Stonewall. That doesn't mean there's not much more that we need to do, but I think we, we, have, we have done a lot to create an environment where everyone is included. I think particularly for first year students, we know that that's a very challenging time for many reasons, but it's also often the first opportunity when students can meet other LGBTQ plus people and also uh, think about their own identities uh, as part of that community. That's been a little bit constrained by COVID, but I hope that bringing people for an event like this is a way that we can help in some way. And I'm very grateful to the work being done by the Student Union and LSE Spectrum to try and support, especially our new students uh, in the community at this time. It's a huge source of pride for me that LSE students of the past played such a key role in, in fighting for LGBTQ plus rights. Uh, and I have no doubt that our students will do so in the future. You are all role models and positive examples of change and how we can change people's attitudes and opinions and open up society for everyone. So it's a huge pleasure for me to open this event and I very much hope that you all have a wonderful occasion and I'm going to hand over now to Rishi Madlani for, uh, to, who'll be your chair for the event. Thank you very much, Manish. And it gives me much pride to see that our director of the LSE has a pride flag in her home that she could pull out for, for this occasion, which uh, sends, sends a good positive signal about the, the flavour of the school, leadership of the school. So good evening and welcome to the LSE of this event. As Manish said, my name is Rishi Madlani and I'm a London School of Economics and Political Science uh, Sciences alumnus and former General Secretary of LSE Students' Union. I've recently retired from the Court of Governors and I know you will be thinking I look far too young to be retiring, but that's thanks to good governance and, uh, and two term limits. When I first came to school, I was a scared, closeted British Indian boy, the son of two parents born in Uganda and Tanzania. And I could not have imagined that 20 years later, I'd be chairing one, let alone two LGBT events at the LSE in five days. Last week with Embrace, 
and Spectrum and with the Alumni Association, we hosted an event about being black and queer at LSE and with the, uh, with the Africa Centre, really still tackling some of the challenges that parts of our community face today. I still remember fondly my first venture up to uh, the LSESU's LGBT Society and now Pride Alliance, and I was delighted to speak to the chair of that this week, and uh, as well as the LGBTSU officer. Activity is as vibrant on campus now as it was then, and the LGBT community brings such vibrancy and colour to this. Today, I wanted to put, well, delighted to be opening this, helping to open this event today, because we need more visible LGBT people in society still. News talks about the progress we have made. Unfortunately, the situation by, is by no means perfect. Just this week, we read that hate crimes have been trembling in the, in the UK in the last five years. And the UK government's uh, LGBT survey of, uh, 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 survey of LGBT people showed that two, over two thirds of our community is still afraid to hold hands. Two in five people had had negative experiences um, in the last 12 months. And I'm sad to say I'm one of those and I'm no victim. And I refuse to, uh, and I've reported to the police, and these are things that we need to do. Today, tonight, we're going to look back to what uh, that first, the first meeting of the GLF, the first meetings of the GLF, and how, how that moved. And we're going to reflect on how far we've come and progressed. Ahead of the main event, on behalf of all the people who are attending today, I also want to pay tribute to some of the other founders of the, of the GLF, some of whom are holding a vigil tonight um, at the LSE and will be joining the event uh, later. Activists like Peter Tatchell, Stuart Feather, Andrew Lawnsley, who are out there tonight. And it's actually thanks to the tireless work of them and activists and campaigners like Jeffrey and Angela that have paved the way for improvement in, in our society here today. So I'm really pleased to welcome you all to this online event, 50 years on from the founding of the Gay Liberation Front. Progress made since and applicability today. We're celebrating today that it was 50 years ago that UK Gay Liberation Front had its first meeting on LSE's campus. So I'm going to, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first fantastic first two speakers we have tonight. Angela Mason is a Labour councillor for Cantalow's Ward and Camden's cabinet member for Best Start for Children and Families. She was an early member of the Gay Liberation Front. She said not the first meeting, but she was early at the party, which is it's a good time, good place to be. And she was an executive director of Stonewall from 1992 to 2002. She's an alumnus of LSE and was made an honorary fellow of the school in 2011. Jeffrey joined the LSE as a research assistant in October 1970, and a few weeks later he got involved in the GLF in the third meeting, taking part in the first demo in Highbury Fields in, in November. Involvement in the, in the gay liberation movement has changed his life. In the 70s, he was a pioneer of LGBT history, writing account of the emergence of the movement coming out. He's now an emeritus professor of, at LSBU and he's received various honours for his work, including his OBE in 2012, and the gold medal of the World Association of Sexology in 2018. And I had the pleasure of um, serving with him on the board of Opening Doors London, a charity helping um, to set support of the older LGBT people. We'll first hear from Angela Mason and Jeffrey Weeks, followed by a presentation from Dr. Gillian Murphy and, and, and Dr. Jacob Breslow. But I'll introduce those when we get to those. Um, there is, as always, with every LSE event, there's plenty of opportunity to ask questions. So please do use the Q&A function uh, to raise questions or those watching on, uh, on, on Facebook or on Twitter, please uh, uh, ask questions. For those Twitter users in the audience, the hashtag for today's event is hashtag LSEGLF. The online event is being recorded and will hopefully be made available as a podcast subject to no technical difficulties. So without further ado, let me turn to Angela and Jeffrey. Angela, first, can I ask you about your early memories of the GLF? Well, <laughs> as I say, as you said, I, I came quite early to the party. And my memory is that I came to my first meeting as a kind of self-appointed messenger from the Women's Liberation Front. And I bought greetings from my Women's Liberation Group. And I wanted to discuss whether the GLF might join us in a march for International Women's Day in, later in the year. And um, so uh, at the first meeting that I recall was in St. Clement's building. It, there was about 200 odd people. We were all sitting on the floor. And um, I got up and gave my spiel. And then I thought, oh, I've done it. And then the chair, the first chair of GLF was a man called Warren Haig, an American, I expect you remember him, Jeffrey. And he said, just before you sit down, 
he said, we have a rule here. You have to say whether, you, if anybody speaks, you have to say whether you're gay or straight. And I'd been really pre pretty closeted for the whole of my life. And I'd never had the courage to come out. And suddenly I had to decide what to do. So I said, yes, yes, I am gay. I didn't even say I'm a lesbian. I said, I'm gay and sank to the floor. But uh, that was a great before and after moment in, in my life. And uh, like everybody else, um, it was truly personally liberating. And the wonderful thing about personal liberation and coming out was, as Jeffrey will know, that it was collective. So at the same time, we were becoming politically visible as we became personally liberated. And you couldn't ask for much more than that. Wonderfully powerful, Jeffrey. Your, your turn. What were your first memories of the GLF? <laughs> Well, I had been a student in London um, and I'd uh, begun to lead a full gay life um, in the closeted way that was so typical of the period. Um, I'm be becoming increasingly dissatisfied with it, um, particularly the fact that I remained closeted, that there was no way I could tell anyone. I had a network of friends, I had a sexual life, but what I couldn't get was any sense of recognition of my sexuality with family or wider circles. So I was getting to the stage where I felt something had to happen in my life. Um, quite by chance, I um, started work at the LSE on the 1st of October, 1970. And LSE at that time was in one of its revolutionary moods. So it was burbling with all sorts of energy. Um, and every day in the refectory, there were dozens, hundreds of leaflets about various events going on. Um, and rumbling through them, I picked up one um, saying that on the 13th of October, there was going to be the first meeting of the London Gay Liberation Front. Well, I cheered of uh, GLF through um, what was happening in America. Um, I read brief accounts of it in the press, but got no real sense of it. Um, but immediately I felt this was something I had to be involved with. And I couldn't go to the first meeting. Um, so by the third meeting, I was ready to go and I went. Um, and I have to say, um, it sounds a cliche, but it's absolutely true that that first meeting changed my life completely. Everything changed for me in the next couple of months. I, um, I came out uh, in this collective atmosphere which encouraged coming out. Um, I realised my politics for the first time. I had a sense of international links through GLF. I had a sense that what I was was linked to the struggle of women and black people and the anti-imperialist struggle. They weren't just abstract, they were part of um, what GLF represented for me. Um, I changed my style of dress. Um, I changed uh, my friendship networks. I met a whole group of new friends that first time. Um, eventually, I changed my career. Um, I changed my housing arrangement. Um, and above all, I met my first long-term lover, um, Angus Sutty, who I was with for many years um, and remained a strong friend of until he died in the early 90s. So that critical moment, that one night, changed everything as far as I was concerned. Amazing, so powerful there, Geoffrey, and I can hear the passion today in, in your voice uh, as you speak. And can I ask you both, what, what was different? What was new at GLF? What, what was different from other campaigns at the time? Uh, Angela, do you want to go there first? Well, I wasn't involved in any other um, homosexual campaigns, but uh, they were, um, they, they certainly weren't situating the oppression of lesbians and gay men in the context of the oppression of other people. And I think the other difference was that um, they weren't concerned with personal liberation. They were concerned more formally with trying to achieve, quite rightly, achieve civil rights for lesbians and gay men. 
But for us, the theme of personal liberation went hand in hand, as I think Jeffrey has already said. We wanted to change the world. I mean, there was no question about it. Uh, we might just be in a classroom at St. Clement's Day, Day building, St. Clement's building, but we were definitely going to change the world. And uh, we were going to change the world by linking up, uh, well, by our own actions and spreading the word about uh, lesbians and gays. And we did do that. I mean, one of the real achievements, I think, of the Gay Liberation Front was it did allow thousands and thousands and thousands of LGBT people to come out and to live free and, and open lives. And if that hadn't happened, I don't think we'd have had the basis for the civil rights movements like Stonewall, which, which, came, which came later in the day. But we did also, I think, feel a real solidarity with other other groups and I was obviously particularly involved with women's liberation and um, one of the early actions at GLF I took part in was I suggested that the women should meet separately. We had these big general meetings and then there would be all these side meetings about particular issues and I suggested that the women of GLF all, all met together separately. And that, that uh, began and was very successful. And we all used to meet later on, on a Friday evening. And then we as women's GLF wanted to take part in women's liberation. And the Women's Liberation National Conference had just happened a little while ago. And um, we, we applied actually to become members of women's liberation. But unfortunately, by that time, women's liberation had been taken over temporarily by a Maoist sect. And um, so I wrote and uh, sent my one pound postal order asking to join uh, women's liberation. And it was sent back to me <laughs> and I still have it. I have it here, in fact. Um, I still have it. And I was, we were told that uh, women's uh, being gay was a deviant sexuality and we couldn't possibly be members of women's liberation. But later, we went to the second women's liberation conference at Skegness and my friend, very good friend, dear friend, Sarah Grimes and I went onto the stage and grabbed the microphone and said, uh, we are not having this. <laughs> we, we are part of women's liberation. We think the conference should break up into small groups and discuss sexuality. And it did. And that was the end of the Maoists. <laughs> <laughs> Who'd have known so Skegness had such... The sort of gay liberation action and things like that were happening all the time, really. Um, we had particular focus on anti-psychiatry, uh, Jeffrey, I think, was talking about the first uh, march uh, at Highbury Fields when somebody was arrested, I think, for gross indecency. So we did traditional things like marches, and then we also did all sorts of zaps and actions. We had things called think-ins. Do you remember the think-ins, Jeffrey? And I, I talked about them at Camden recently because they were, weren't just a group of people giving their opinions. It, it was a what we tried to articulate was our collective experience and it was it was quite a wonderful way of expanding your consciousness and trying to come to grips with with a problem and we also had gay days with, um so we always to go to these parks around london <laughs> and play gay games <laughs> to the amusement and astonishment of many people using using the park. We had the ball kissing game. I, we threw had we had a we be a big circle and the person in the middle threw a ball to somebody in the circle and, and then the person had to come kiss the person in the middle. And I remember being in Vicky Park. We'd gone in solidarity with the East End. We had this notion that in solidarity, working class, we'd go to Vicky Park. So the ball was thrown and it went boy, girl, boy, girl. So it all seemed quite innocent. And then it started going boy, boy, girl, girl. So there's all this uh, same sex kissing. And there were these a group of teenagers by me and they said, oh, God, some of them are queer. You know, I think they're all bleeding queer. <laughs> 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 but 
at least we were coming out and being, being visible and trying to make connections with different members of the community. I hope the young gays who now go to the Mighty Hoopla and other festivals in Vicky Park are aware of the, what, what preceded <laughs> them. Um, I, I don't think they all are, but Je Jeffrey, what about you? What was new for you? What, 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 what was the catalyst for change this time for you? Well, everything in a sense was new, but I think the, the crucial thing that differentiated from earlier movements was that we no longer saw our gayness, our queerness as an individual quirk, a reason for shame, a reason for guilt, and so on, which had been the dominant note. We saw our gayness as a resistance to oppression. Um, and everything Angela has said about our, our involvement with other movements and so on was, was absolutely critical to that notion. We were oppressed people. Now, that's how we saw ourselves. We would the result of inherent sexism or what today would be called heterosexism or homophobia, but there were structural reasons for our sexuality. So our practice that Angela was described was both on the grand scale of demonstrating, of, of zapping meetings and so on, um, which was trying to make our presence felt on the public stage, but it was also about transforming our heads, trying to live differently. Um, so the smaller, apparently the smallest thing, um, which as was mentioned earlier, is still very difficult to hold hands in public. It's in public, We yeah. saw as a revolutionary act. We were confronting the wider society with our, our pride in our sexuality. At the same time, we got involved in larger demos. There was the first uh, gay demo in November 1970, which uh, Angus and I went on and many others, of course. Um, and then we went on the TUC march against the Heath government's Industrial Relations Act in January uh, 1971. We were stuck at the end. With they put the, us at uh, the back all the time. With the sectarian <laughs> groups and so on. Stuck. It was a million strong and we were stuck right at the back. Um, and they didn't know what to do with us. And then many of the men went on the, uh, the Women's Day, International Women's Day uh, March in early March, I think, uh, 1971. And I think that was the last time men were allowed on it. But we wanted to show our solidarity with women. So there were many things built in to GLF. I got involved in it, like many others, most of us probably, in a consciousness raising group, which is about changing ourselves. And we got involved in larger collective demonstrations, which is about showing our solidarity with other movements um, and showing that we were part of the movement to change society. Brilliant, Jeffrey. And, and I mean, I think we'd be remiss. It's um, Black History Month, obviously, right now. And there's been a fantastic range of events at the LSE. Um, celebrate this. And, you know, and Angela, the, the book you kindly lent me from Stuart Feather referenced that the uh, two students had gone over to a Black Panthers meeting. Um, and I guess would I, I'd love to hear a bit more from you about what was the diversity of the members of GLF? Were there people of colour? Were there was there recognition of bisexuality? What what was the trans ex experience? Um, and do you want to go first or? Um, well, I'll start. And Jeffrey, Jeffrey is the historian of the movement, so <laughs> he will give the most rounded answer. Um, well. It is, I mean, it is true that uh, I think Aubrey went to, it's a marvellous name, the Revolutionary People's Constitutional Convention, which was held, which was a uh, Black Panthers convention to rewrite, I think, the American Constitution. Um, and I think it was at that uh, meeting that Huey Newton came out in support of gay liberation, which is interesting in and of itself, because other Panthers like cleavage uh, were, were, were homophobic and um, so there was always this connection with black power and indeed the way in which the Panthers organized black liberation movements organized and women's liberation organized and gay liberation organized had much really in common um, they were uh, so um, so there was there was learning, although I think there weren't that many black people in um, in GLF, nor nor really in the women's movement. But um, because we met later, 
in Notting Hill Gate, at the big church, All Saints Hall in Notting Hill Gate. There was a certain amount of connection with um, black organization in, in Notting Hill Gate. And I remember when the mangrove uh, was raided, I remember being out on the streets with friends um, that, that, that night. So um, there were some connections and I think but you know, it could have. It was was I think essentially a, a, a white movement, both GLF and 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 the women's liberation movement. So we we have a lot to learn in in that respect. Um, but there were those connections, and I think it's quite interesting now that there've been several films. Um, there's obviously Steve McQueen's new film about the Mangrove Nine. Um, there's a film about Abby Hoffman and the anti-Vietnam uh, trial, the Chicago trial. And there's also been the film about the Miss World demonstration, which I was also involved in. And I think those sort of politics, those sort of revolutionary politics, it seems to me maybe the times are so awful as they were then, and there was a great deal of political ferment, but maybe that these sort of ideas and concepts and ways of organising are, are coming back again, maybe. I think it's uh, important to remember because, <coughs> excuse me, languages change, that when we adopted gay as our self-description, it was something that right at the beginning was universal. It was all embracing. It included men and women, black and white, trans and cis, and, and so on. It was deliberately a general term, a bit like queer has the same usage uh, today. But the old queer usage meant a very particular thing. Um, so we adopted gay to reject the old language of queer. Um, but of course, as time went on, pretty rapidly actually, um, all the tensions with the different elements of the constituency of gay liberation began to express their own identity much more clearly. Angela's described how women began to meet separately um, and bi people felt that they were being ignored. Trans people felt that they were being ignored. So gradually, or more and more rapidly as time went on, all these bits began to splinter off actually. So by the end of the 1970s, gay tended to mean white homosexual men um, and women by, the, by and large was now calling themselves lesbian rather than gay. Um, and other groups began to affirm their own linked identity. And it was only much later that we came together again and uh, the LGBTQ plus um, acronyms um, or a, a redefined notion of queer. Brilliant. And I'm going to give you both a very brief respite as we, but don't worry to those people who are asking Q&A and questions. We're coming back to those. Angela and Jeffrey get a brief breather as we have a segue into Gillian, um, uh, who's going to present from the library. Gillian Murphy is the curator for Equality, Rights and Citizenship at the LSE Library. She moved to LSE with the Women's Library in 2013, where she worked as an archivist for many years. Gillian promotes the Women's Library Collection and the Hall Carpenter Archives through exhibitions, talks, blogs and workshops. So without further ado, Gillian. Mm. No, he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to move. Okay, sorry about this, but it doesn't want to, um, I don't know, I'll just start anyway. So this presentation uses archives from the Hall Carpenter Archives and the Women's Library. And we hold many papers of GLF, GLF activists, including Angela Mason and Elizabeth Wilson and Geoffrey Weeks, but also John Chesterman, Rupert Beach, Lisa Power, Michael Brown, Mary McIntosh and Peter Tatchell, to name a few. Um, I'm going to start with this uh, report, which was published in The Beaver, which is LSE's student newspaper. And it's a report of the first meeting of GLF 
at LSE. And it says that 20 people attended the first meeting and two of them who are not named, but would be Bob Mellors and Aubrey Walter, gave their experiences of the GF, of GLF in the States and how the GLF grew out of the Stonewall riots in Greenwich Village in 1969 and that a year later, there were gay pride marches in New York, Los Angeles and Chicago. The second paragraph is very interesting for its powerful language, um, which sets out how GLF was going to develop in the UK. And I'm gonna read part of that paragraph. We are fighting to end the oppression of gay people. We are struggling to liberate ourselves. The worst part of our oppression that we absorb the crap the straight world throws at us and we become sick and filled with self-hatred. We regard ourselves as perverted. This is wrong because homosexuality is just as natural as heterosexuality. And this report was put together by the secretary of the Gay Liberation Front, who is unnamed. So GLF quickly drew up a list of demands um, of basic human rights. And this is an early uh, leaflet and it shows eight demands. And I'm going to read some of them. So the first one that all discrimination against gay people, male and female by the law, by employers and by society at large should end. And that is a basic human right. Um, that sex education in schools stop being exclusively heterosexual and that is still an issue today. And I'll just read out the last one that gay people be free to hold hands and kiss in public as are heterosexuals. Um, and this was a demand for freedom to be themselves. Gay is good, this is a slogan that you see repeated in the archive and all power to oppress people. This is a, again, a slogan that is repeated in the archive. And um, this was for meetings. This was to encourage people to come to meetings, this leaflet, and you can see it's at St. Clement's building at the bottom there. This is a poster, um, again, advertising a meeting at LSC. It's hand drawn. And um, the message is Gay Liberation Front, brothers and sisters united against oppression. And there was this idea of solidarity, of coming together and facing the world. But quite quickly, um, well, sorry. Um, so GLF meetings were very democratic and there was no hierarchy. And a distinctive feature was the thinking, which Angela mentioned, when large meetings were broken up into small unstructured discussion groups where ideas were worked out. But after a few meetings, it became clear that practical things were difficult to achieve in large numbers and more functional groups were needed. Um, so the media workshop was one of the first groups to form and it produced Come Together, which was the newspaper of GLF. And this image is um, an issue that was put together by the women in GLF. And you can see some of them there. It was the manifesto group and many women in GLF were in this group. The manifesto was published in October, 1971 and it sought to explain why LGBT people were oppressed and tried to map a way forward. There was the counter psychiatry group, um, because at this time, homosexuality was seen as an illness, something that could be cured. And this group tried to counter that prejudice. There was the street theatre group. There was a demonstration group. This, was, this is a collage of images from the anti-industrial relations bill demonstration in 1971 was the youth group and this image is from, nine, from August 1971 and it shows a demonstration against the age of consent which for gay men at the time was 21. GLF organised um, gay pride marches, the first one was in 1972 and it was important for um, people to come together to be visible and to be seen and these images are always very striking for the number of police that are in them. 
The GLF was about coming together, ending discrimination and oppression, um, but it was also about meeting people and there was a social side to GLF. And this is a poster for the first Gay Liberation Front Dance. Um, it was at Kensington Town Hall on the 22nd of December, 1970. And um, the messages are very strong, come together, come out, come along now. So GLF organized gay days, there was always this element of fun. And GLF actively supported other oppressed groups, such as Women's Liberation, as Angela's mentioned, and Jeffrey. Um, and Women's Liberation is also um, marking its 50th anniversary this year. So GLF joined many women's liberation struggles, beginning with the Miss World demonstration in 1970, when the street theatre group held its own misused outside the Royal Albert Hall. GLF's message spread around the country, and this is an image of a thinking at Leeds University, and other GLF groups emerged in Bristol, Cardiff, Edinburgh, and Manchester. By 1971, new GLF groups were forming in London and the first one was in Camden, and this is a leaflet for that. Um, but there were lots of groups in uh, London. There was one in Notting Hill, which was known for its radical drag. There was another one in South London um, that had a commune and a theatre group, which became known as the Brixton Fairies. So GLF was a trailblazer and led the way from the traditional gay ghetto where people led double lives to broadening support activities for people within the LGBT community, including new clubs, dating services, publishing books and newspapers, opening bookshops, telephone helplines, counseling services, to the formation of new groups such as the lesbian and gay Christian movement, the black lesbian and gay group, groups of teenage gays, disabled gays and older lesbians. And what follows are some images from the archive to illustrate these um, points. So Friend was a counselling service. We get things like uh, guides for disabled gays, edges this is for LGCM, uh, Blackout, which is a great title for a magazine, Gay Youth, Older Lesbian Newsletter. And if you want to find out more, we have an online exhibition about GLF in Britain on our Google Arts and Culture platform, which has more about the women in GLF. We also have um, an exhibition on outrage, which is marking its 30th anniversary this year. And we have um, a, lot of, a selection of images from the archive on our uh, Flickr account, which you can download for free. Okay, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Julian. That was a wonderful whistle stop tour. And I can see Angela and Jeffrey both uh, smiling wryly at uh, having brought back some memories there. Before we return to them, however, we've got another treat from the LSE today. Um, it's, um, it gives me a pleasure to introduce Jacob Breslow, who's an assistant professor of sexuality and gender at the LSE Department of Gender Studies. He's author of Ambivalent Childhoods, Speculative Futures and the Psychic Life of the Child, forthcoming with the University of Minnesota Press. His research is published in Comparative American Studies, American Quarterly, Porn Studies, and Transgender Studies Quarterly. So without further ado, Jacob, over to you. Great, thank you. Um, hi everyone, and um, thanks to Rishi uh, and Ben for the invitation today uh, and for organizing the event. And thank you also to Nick and everybody who works at the LSE events uh, team for all the labor that went into today's talk. Um, also, just want to say thank you to, to Jeffrey, Angela, and Gillian for those amazing um, stories and for those fantastic uh, archives. I really look forward to continuing the conversation with you all. So I'm just going to um, talk briefly about how we might contextualize the GLF in today's political moment. This, um, however, is clearly an extraordinary task, and so I'm inevitably going to give a partial picture of, <clears throat> of the movements and issues that are central to contemporary LGBT, queer, and trans organizing. And actually, I think um, looking over some of the questions, I think this is a really important thing to recognize and name for social justice movements often bear the burden of having to account for everything. Um, and this burden, while a necessary demand in terms of accountability, 
is an extraordinary site of struggle and inevitable failure, as has already sort of been talked about in terms of GLF. So learning from Angela, Jeffrey, and Jillian, I want to think about how we might think about gay liberation in today's uh, contemporary moment. Doing so, I'll need to move back and forth a bit, uh, as we've been doing, between this naming of gay liberation and queer and trans liberation. Um, but I want to start here with a question. What does it mean to talk about gay rights or queer and trans freedoms and liberation uh, when we're in a political moment where, for many people, the mainstream cultural imaginary is one in which gay rights have already been won? What asking this question exposes, I think, is that the mainstream understandings of homophobia, transphobia, sexism, sexual violence, sexual subjectivity, the interconnections between contemporary racisms, xenophobia, nationalisms, and sex negativity, all of these are extraordinarily skewed by a discourse which imagines social justice to happen immediately through the law. It's almost as if once there's marriage equality and love becomes, as we all know, love, then all the other messy questions about care, justice, intimacy, exclusion, violence, collective struggle, harm, death, and of course, pleasure, all these other struggles become rendered somewhat moot. And we've already sort of said how this disjuncture between mainstream perception and daily reality, a daily reality which saw hate crimes motivated by homophobia increased by 19% last year, and hate crimes uh, motivated by transphobia jumped by 16%. We know that this is alarming. And it's a disjuncture that I think demonstrates a, a stifled capacity to understand the ways in which homophobia, sexism, racism, and transphobia constitute the contemporary life for queer and trans people. This dilemma, however, is something that the GLF understood really well. On one hand, they advocated, of course, uh, for the shifting of law. How could they not? Indeed, while the GLF formed three years after the decriminalization of same-sex sex, many other discriminatory laws were on the books or like Section 28 were on the horizon. And all of these laws needed to be overturned with expediency, an expediency that unfortunately didn't happen with the overturning of Section 28. At the same time, uh, however, the GLF recognized that the law was insufficient as a site of intervention. In the GLF manifesto that Jillian just showed you um, the cover of, which was initially published in 1971, the GLF said this. They said, quote, gay people are oppressed. Shouldn't we demand reforms that will give us tolerance and equality? Certainly we should. But once they made this somewhat uh, cheeky acknowledgement, they then continued on with the following. They said, but gay liberation does not just mean reforms. It means a revolutionary change in our whole society. Reforms may make things better for a while as changes in the law can make straight people a little less hostile, a little more tolerant. But reform cannot change the deep down attitude of straight people that homosexuality is at best inferior to their own way of life. This acknowledgement that reform does not equal liberation is an extraordinarily important recognition, particularly in a moment that, as I said, imagines, <clears throat> imagines gay rights. And the wording of that is, is really important. Um, imagines gay rights to be successful. You'll notice, uh, I imagine, that most politicians who espouse the rhetoric of the success and progress of the nation to accommodate gay rights never discuss this through the language of queer and trans liberation. So what might queer and trans liberation look like today and what are some of the ways in which it's being organized, demanded and enacted? In the time that I have remaining, uh, I wanna give one example of an intersectional queer liberation movement. Uh, and then I wanna speak about the impact um, uh, of addressing the sort of heightened and amplified transphobia that's endemic to this particular juncture. There are, I should say, so many examples of queer organizing that I want to name from lesbians and gays support the migrants to the outsiders project to the queer and trans inclusive um, sisters uncut to the English collective of prostitutes and the sex worker advocacy resistance movement or the swarm collective. But I only really have time for one. So I'm going to focus on bent bars. 
Now, all of these organizations, I, I should note though, are ones that are particularly salient in this moment of pandemic politics. As the globalized world becomes uh, reduced to the household, as nations ramp up their policies of deportation, border making, incarceration, and detention. And I name these organizations as well, because part of what they demonstrate through their actions is that radical queer and trans politics needs to begin with the communities and individuals that are most severely impacted by multiple forms um, of state and interpersonal violence. Single issue organizing is insufficient, that is, to counter the multi-stranded arms of state power and violence that queer and trans people live through, particularly queer and trans people of color and are those um, in incarceration or experiencing homelessness. So let me tell you a little bit about um, Bent Bars, um, which is an organization I, I know. Um, they're a letter writing organization that puts queer and trans people inside and outside of prison into contact with one another in order to combat the stifling isolation of state capture and social death that is the prison system. For them, radical queer politics must be oriented towards abolition, not reform. And this is something that I would imagine uh, sit rather well with the GLF of the 1970s, as many gay and lesbian people were, and indeed um, in somewhat different ways still are, subject to laws which seek to criminalize, fine, and incarcerate them. For queer and trans people behind bars, particularly people who perhaps found themselves there through a combination of a systematically racist police force, the criminalization of survival sex, a, surveil a surveillance state oriented towards detaining migrants and non-normative subjects of various kinds, we would do well to remember the words of the GLF who cautioned against the politics of reform. Reform in this scene of the political that engages with the prison is the politics which would demand for example, uh, that the prison properly house trans people in accordance with their gender. This is a demand that while absolutely necessary to providing literally the bare minimum modicum of respect for trans people, actually uh, seeks to further expand the funding of the prison rather than its abolition. A radical politics informed by the framings of liberation and freedom inspired by the GLF would join the work of organizations like Bent Bars in seeking the abolition of the prison and the detention center and cultivate transformative queer and trans justice uh, instead. And this then um, brings me somewhat neatly to the last thing I wanted to say um, and speak about tonight. And that's about the politics of hyperbolic and virulent transphobia that constitute this contemporary moment in the UK. As you'll most likely be aware, uh, we have just come out on the other side of a three year process of consultation and debate over the inclusion of trans people within the UK and within UK daily life. Despite the fact that over 70% of people who responded to this consultation by the government on the Gender Recognition Act advocated for expansion of trans affirmative care and recognition, the current conservative government has all but failed its trans citizens. Meager shifts in response to the consultation have been proposed, but, uh, but they are ones that, appear only, that only appear progressive and affirmative amidst a cultural and political landscape of toxic transphobia, racism, sexism, and abandonment that has been cultivated by the government itself. We know, or we should know, that putting rights and value of stigmatized communities up for a vote or consultation by the public will inevitably lead to the granting of platforms to violent, harmful, and pathologizing rhetoric. And indeed, this is precisely what has taken place. We have lived through years now of transphobia being granted a free pass in the name of debate. Despite years of campaigning and years of consultation, trans people in the UK are no better off now than they were three years ago. Indeed, the structural and interpersonal forms of transphobia that are saturated across all aspects of life in this country have been solidified, not torn down. We as people uh, invested in seeking out the radical potentials of a future that really embraces the GLF's call for queer and trans liberation and freedom have extraordinary amounts of work to do. Thanks everyone. Fantastic, Jacob. Thanks so much. And thanks to all the speakers so far. So to bring the panel together now and uh, to take some of uh, the audience questions, I guess I first want to throw it to uh, Angela and Jeffrey to give them a chance to, to reflect on what lessons do we do, you, do they feel the GLF has and what are the learnings of the relevance today, and particularly in, in light of some of the challenges that Jacob uh, presented so eloquently just now. 
Jeffrey, do you want to go first this time? Let's, let's, let's okay. Let's, let's uh, take your... Well, I think um, as uh, Jacob showed, it hasn't been a straight path towards liberation from 1970 to the present. Um, in fact, if you look at the history, there have been waves of change. The early 70s were the period of euphoria, really, of utopian hopes, of enthusiasm, of mobilization, and it transformed people's identities and sense of being in the world. That was crucial. But already by the mid 70s, it was beginning to fragment. And we enter a period in Britain and in fact internationally, where the, the right, the conservative right, the moral right began to show their teeth and mobilize against the gains of the early 90s, early um, um, 70s. Um, and of course, by the end of the 1970s, we see the arrival of the Thatcher government, uh, Margaret Thatcher, although she had personal friends as gays, many Tory MPs were, were gay, was hostile to homosexuality as a social presence. The 80s was also the period of AIDS, and this fed into a backlash which climaxed in, in section 28. But that in turn produced a new mobilization focused very much on, um, on the achievement of legal recognition. Stonewall was crucial in that, but also I think um, outrage, a crucial partner, although they were quite distinct, uh, they were in a sense working along the same path from different uh, angles. And then we see through the 90s, the move towards uh, equal rights. Now, to sum up, I think what we see by the turn of the century with the reforms of the Blair, gov Blair and Brown governments that Angela played such a major part in shaping is the formal achievement of equal citizenship. But once you get equal citizenship, as the experience of everyone around the world, from black minorities to women, formal equality is not enough. It's never enough. And citizen has to be realized, citizenship has to be realized in the nitty-gritty, the, the granular of any society. Now, there are legitimately different attitudes towards how you do that. But my own view, and you mentioned it earlier on, Rishi, is that it's through organisations like Opening Doors London, which work to speak with and for uh, older LGBT people. It's through the work of organisations like that, they begin to realise the limitations of formal citizenship and the need all the time to go further. And you can see that in all sorts of areas of LGBTQ politics, um, particularly the more um, vocal mobilization of trans people over the last 10, 15 years, uh, and much more explicit uh, by um, um, culture and so on. Uh, and these are doing what I'm saying, trying to realize the meanings of citizenship. Now, there's lots of debate where we go from here, but the fact that citizenship has to be fully realized, I think, is the reality of the culture we live in. Formal equality is never enough. It has to be fully enacted and performed and lived. Angela, I'd love you to come in there and especially... Just, well, just you... quickly, because people want to ask oh, questions. Cool. Um, well, uh, Jacob quite rightly points to the revolutionary aspirations of... Uh, of, of GLF and uh, the aspirations of, of liberation and changing, changing the whole system and doing that by linking together with other oppressed groups. And um, I think that is very relevant today. I mean, obviously I'm particularly associated with Stonewall and a long period of fighting for uh, civil rights, for citizenship. But when I look at the world today, um, I see perhaps the biggest threat to all of us um, right across the LGBTQ plus sin spectrum is in fact the, the growth of the right um, 
And it's not just the far right, it's the right. And what I see is uh, that gradually attempts are being, really serious attempts are being made to undermine many of the constitutional uh, institutions and civic institutions that allowed people like Jeffrey and I to come out in the first place and allowed the whole struggle for the end of discrimination and civil rights to take place. And I think in that context, we all have a real duty to learn again, which is never easy, how we can listen to each other and work together to face what I believe is a common enemy. And if we just go on taking chunks out of each other, then the only people that will benefit are people who would wish to deny us our being altogether. So um, to the extent you point to the revolutionary um, aspirations of GLF, I think that's an appropriate, this is an appropriate time, political time to think about that and think about the relevance of those aspirations. Right, I've got a lot of questions coming through. So I'm going to try and take one audience question here. And um, Jacob, unless you wanted to come back in on that point, I saw you leaning forward on the Zoom. Um, just, I would just quickly say, I think those are all great points. And also that, um, you know, the one of the things that's true for all social movements is that there will inevitably be discussions around and debates over their terms and who's included and who's excluded. And, and I see, you know, the and calls for unity versus calls for fragmentation. Those are part and parcel of, of social movement activism, um, and they're true for both the GLF and for others. So they are also the, those demands around um, uh, shifting who, who is speaking on whose behalf and what terms and through which language um, uh, sort of constitute the life of social movements, even if they sometimes bring that movement in its current formation down. Um, so, you know, I think we can think of those as, as moments of failure, but also we can think of them as the, the productive vibrancy of, so, of the That's difficulty good. of working with one another, right? And they become, they're, they're sort of central to its um, legacy as well. That's right. So the first question I'm taking from the audience here today, and there's a lot coming through, so please keep putting them in the Q&A uh, or tweeting them uh, with hashtag LSEGLF or on the Facebook Live. First question is an international one from Andrew Shield, Assistant Pref <laughs> Professor of History at University of Leiden. What is a common uh, misconception or misconception you hear about the GLF, uh, and particularly with reference to Stonewall's 50th? I don't know if I quite understood that. <laughs> are, are there, are there mis misconceptions you hear, you, you, you've since heard about the GLF and um, reflecting back now? Or maybe there are none. <laughs> Jeff, are there, are there... Well, I think uh, one of the <coughs> misconceptions which was there from the start is that GLFers were wild, um, out of their heads, militants. Um, and the more traditional organisations, like the Campaign for Homosexual Equality, were the sober-suited, um, well-organised, um, modest um, liberal organization. Well, it wasn't quite like that because right from the beginning, GLF had many people who wanted to focus on legal change um, and were sober suited. And CHE had people who'd been very much influenced by GLF. So right from the start, I think the movements began to zig in and out, out of each other. Um, and they very rapidly, began to represent different strands. I, for instance, got uh, um, involved in um, a, a journal called Gay Left, um, which was very much focusing on the, um, the socialist Marxist elements of gay liberation. Others in GLF were increasingly focused on lifestyle changes um, and um, changing our heads. There were different elements, which at the beginning were all together you know, like in uh, uh, the nucleus of something, and then they exploded and went in all directions. Um, and I think, in retrospect, that going in many different directions was probably one of the most influential 
things. People lament the GLF um, world out of control and uh, um, s disappeared within four or five years. But actually, it never disappeared. It lives on in all sorts of things. And you can see it living on in the debates today um, that, um, that Jacob mentioned. The seeds were scattered in many different directions. Um, so yes, you can find things that were a bit odd or wrong or you didn't like, but, but actually looking back at it historically, it's been the most successful of the social movements of the 1970s, I think, in that its seeds are scattered everywhere and still um, energizing debate. I have, I've always thought there was a continuity between um, GLF and Stonewall. And I, I think it's sort of significant that uh, Stonewall were an outrage um, that it was Peter and I, and we both came from very much from, from GLF. And, and that's always been an important bond between us. And if you look at how gay history developed, we wouldn't have been able to defeat Section 28 and to embark on the whole uh, course of the struggle for, for civil rights if, if, if GLF hadn't liberated people to come out. And I mean, Thatcher got it wrong when she and the others when they did Section 28, because that time the genie was out of the box. We, thousands and thousands of lesbians and gay men had actually come out and they were not going to be put back in the box or demonized or made, made illegal. It just wasn't going to happen. And I mean, I always remember the section going on the tube in the, uh, when we were fighting section 28. And you go on the tube and you'd see lots and lots of people wearing anti claws buttons. And I'd sit there and think, my God, there are a lot of us. <laughs> and um, what Stonewall did was give voice to all those people who'd been in a sense liberated by GLF. And that's why we were a powerful force. And that's why I think we could achieve change. I don't know if that was the answer to the question, but anyway, perhaps we should move on. <laughs> so the next question I have is from Lewis Reitman, an LSE alumnus, um, who, who thanks you both for, uh, all for your stories. It's inspiring to hear where our communities come from. His question is, how do you interpret the growing violence against LGBTQ plus people today? What reasons do you see? <coughs> Well, um, I, I would. I mean, I've talked about the, the, the rise, the rise of the right, um, and I think um, we 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 are always fair game when 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 you get those those sort of political movements, and when the d public discourse um, is giving up on on the rule of law, where there's extreme individualism, uh, where hate speech um, gets pretty free reign on on social media. I mean, I think there are a variety of reasons uh, why um, hate, hate crime of all sorts, including against us, um, is, is likely to be on the increase and the figures do, do seem to show that. And it's going to take a really sort of collective effort and organization to combat the, those changes. Uh, well, I think I agree with that, but the, it, it's an odd sort of tribute, but I think the fact that violence has increased and it's become a highly political issue on the right, not only in Western Europe, Britain, but across the world, the way it's been mobilized by conservative forces is a tribute to how much has been achieved. Um, because it's only when there's a certain visibility and people feeling we're taking over that I think there's the energy for political leaders to uh, to use it as a as a tool um, against uh, what's now called gender ideology and uh, and sexual rights, human rights. Um, so it's it's not so much that we're downtrodden, and this is a manifestation of how downtrodden it, we are. It's because we're not downtrodden that it evokes such a vicious. Mm -hmm backlog um, um, of, of attitudes, violence, and so on. And I think, I mean, I've been particularly moved by the plight of our Polish LGBT community, watching 
sort of the rise of LGBT free zones and these vans driving around accusing uh, uh, LGBT people of being paedophiles. And I attended a, a, a recent protest at the Polish embassy in London. And it was just so shocking that there were pro counter protesters there trying to create violence. And I just, you sort of realize how real this is and the battles are there. Jacob, do you, sorry, did you want to come in on the, on the, on the, on the hate crime and what, what, what we can do to tackle it? Well, your, your discussion of vans um, driving around makes me also think about the, the go home vans that were circulating around various parts of England for a while, right? We're, in a, we're also in a moment of, of heightened forms of, of violence that are being directed at various sexual, racial minorities and, and populations. Um, and I think Jeffrey's uh, right in that there's an anti-gender political moment right now um, that, that is also an anti-identity politics moment uh, that's um, been sort of given a lot of um, credence to by various governments and individuals within positions of power that sort of sees um, conversations like the one that we're having today, as well as even fields of knowledge, the department that I work in, for example, um, as being understood or framed as attacks on um, what are understood as modernity or civilization or whatever it might be. So we're in an anti-gender moment. Um, and at the same time, um, as I sort of spoke about in, in my talk, one of the things that we've seen over the last um, couple of years is the, the sort of um, the putting of trans people's life up for debate um, in ways that are supposedly geared towards um, instituting forms of progress, but actually have enabled the platforming of various um, kinds of um, really extreme transphobia to be given credence and given space. And that transphobia, of course, leaks out into other forms of um, anti-gender and anti-queer politics as well. Um, and so I think we're seeing, we're seeing the after effects of that, that these moments of, of violence, of hatred, um, um, of taunting, of interpersonal forms of violence are also a reflection of the fact that these kinds of violence are, are part and parcel of, of daily life. Um, and so I think, you know, we have the, there has been conditions that have set this up. So it's not a surprise, for example, <laughs> that there is an increase in, in hate crime. All you have to do is kind of watch the news um, and see that the conversations that are being had are ones which are constantly questioning queer and trans life that are constantly um, and, and adamantly structured through racism, xenophobia and forms of, of violence that are directed towards people who aren't seen to constitute the nation. That, that's... On the other hand, we have had the Black Lives Matter movement, which is, in my view, being enormously important. I can't remember mm -hmm. a mobilization of the Black BMA community uh, like this and it having such an effect. And mm -hmm. I just feel that for almost the first time in my lifetime, people are listening to those Black voices. I mean, perhaps I'm just an incurable optimist. Uh, so it's quite a, a mixed picture. And I think also the effect of COVID is that inequality um, all around is becoming much more manifest and, and people realize the grave consequences of the inequality that exists in our society. So I'm not sure it's solely a gender moment. I think there's something wider in a sense going on. And GLF happened at a point of real political turmoil. I mean, Northern Ireland was in flames. Uh, Jeffrey was talking about the industrial relations bill there was massive attacks on trade unions. Things were happening, uh, people were being arrested all the time put in prison, uh, there were move, I mean, I was very involved in the women's prison movement, for instance, uh, that made me think of it when you're talking about Ben Bars. I mean, we, we didn't want Holloway to exist, I can assure mm -hmm. you. Um, so so I, I feel something of that sort of turmoil, which is not exclusive to sexual gender politics, but includes it. And I'm sure you're right about the what's happened, the, the trajectory, trajectory around uh, trans, uh, transgender movement, but something bigger, I think, is going on now, rather similar to the context in which GLF was born.
And Andrew, don't worry, I will ask you all to come back with your reason to be optimism at the end sorry, of this evening. Sorry, so we will sorry. send the audience off <laughs> with an act, with act, sorry, energized, activated and, and ready to do something positive in their communities. But I, I share your, your comment on, I mean, on the Black Lives Matter. I've never seen so many people of color, activists of color, engaged, really willing to move and, and, and do stuff. I mean, the, the, the event we had last week, I left it absolutely buzzing with hearing my, you know, of, of LGBT siblings from Jamaica, from Nigeria, coming together at the LSE. And this is the power of, of, of having these, this dialogue and, and Zoom is very connecting, you know, actually, it, I, obviously I'd love to be doing this in person and uh, have a glass of wine afterwards, but actually we can connect and, uh, and bring together. But let me move to the next question. I will come back to optimism. So I'll give you the, the panel a chance to think about what that, that optimism is. And um, one of the uh, similar questions we've had from both Jeffrey Meek from the University of Glasgow and James Watts is around how GLF connected nationwide, both nationwide across um, uh, Oxford, Cambridge, Norwich, and also across the home nations, um, across uh, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Um, Angela or Jeffrey, would one of you like to come in on that? Jeffrey's one good on this. Let Jeffrey go first. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the problem always is um, the angle from which you look at it. For me, who lived in London, the London GLF was absolutely vitally central to my my life but of course there were all sorts of manifestation of the spirit of gay liberation all around the country in, in partly shaped by the different legal situations in scotland and northern ireland where the movement took a different um, um different shape but nevertheless i think what was crucial to all these that were developing around the country um and both angela and i would often travel out to speak um, at meetings in different cities across the uh, uh, across the UK. What was really different about them? They, they may not have had the the sort of politics that GLF in London was absolutely preoccupied with, but they all represented something new, and that was a new self confidence in being openly gay or lesbian or bi or trans or whatever. Um, the Homosexual Law Reform Society that had campaigned to change the law in the 1960s had largely been staffed by, um, by queer men and some women, um, but actually it never declared itself as a gay rights organization, or in the language of the time, a homophile organization. What was different after 1970 was that whatever the form of the groups that bubbled up all over the country, was that they were all openly gay. And I think that's an absolutely crucial shift. Um, and, you know, part of the success of Stonewall was, in many ways, it followed the lobbying techniques of the Homosexual Law Reform Society, which had changed the law in the 60s, but it did so from a completely different angle of being an openly gay organisation. And I think that is crucial because it mobilizes different energies um, and different sorts of support. Brilliant. Next question I have is from um, Dominic Bar Berry, um, who first thanks you all. Um, are there times you've been particularly worried about people being underinformed or misinformed about the history of the GLF and its ambitions? Or have there been times when you've been worried about the uses of its history? I'm just coming to grips with the fact it's 50 years. I mean, I'm not a historian, so um, I'm probably less less conscious of that. Um, uh, I think, um, I, I mean, uh, in the more recent past, there have been uh, it was more normal to uh, usual to set up outrage uh, as against Stonewall, um, and. Um, I, I just always thought it was odd because, as I say, Peter and I came from the same stable. We came from GLF. So in a way, I feel, I suppose I feel that to some extent, the sort of Stonewall outrage uh, discussion uh, obscured uh, the, the unity as well as the contradictions of, of, of the gay liberation movement and certainly tended to obscure both the sense of joy um, of 
agency. Our bit, this confidence that we could do things, we could take actions, we could change the world. And uh, I, I regret that 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 has been a lot to a large extent lost. And also the uh, notion uh, which we've discussed much today of of being. Uh, um, one of many oppressed peoples, and a real the, there being a real unity of the of the oppressed. Jeffrey, did you want to add anything there? Yeah, the um, GLF uh, since the early days has become um, a, a symbol of either positive things as we're expressing, but also of the way things went in a bad direction, uh, especially for people on the. Right, and you see it popping up as an example of how things began to go wrong in the 60s and, and early 70s. It's interesting if you look at the debates around section 28, um, the, um, the arguments of the Tory right who are putting forward section 28 were actually quoting from the JLF manifesto. Um, especially its uh, sentences on the family. Okay. Um, and, you know, the famous clause uh, in, in Section 28 about attacking pretended family relationships. Behind that is this whole discourse of the Tory right that uh, that was all advocated by us um, militants in the early 70s, and that was being brought back into the mid 80s. So, yes, GLF is a movable feast. People have used it in a variety of uh, different ways. Um, you know, I, as a historian who lived through it, try to see it objectively, but I know my, my views on it are inevitably biased. I see it in a particular way, um, but I hope they're not uh, rose-tinted glasses. I hope I see it realistically as this immense force for change which didn't at that point realize all its promise, but the promise is living on, as I said earlier, in many different groups and organizations today. And Jacob, I'd be remiss not to allow you to come in there if you had, to, if, if, if these misconceptions and conceptions, uh, how they play in your work today and, 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 uh, and, and, and yeah, any, any thoughts you have on that? Um, I don't know, I've not spent all that much time um, tracking all the misconceptions of the GLF, so it's hard to speak to that question um, and I think that Jeffrey and Angela did a good job so I, I'm happy to move to the next question to get more uh, people in here. Brilliant um, so um, that was, again a similar question coming from Philip King um, that also ends in a, um, a, a similar theme to one from Nicola Martin um, you've both com you've both commented on, about the hostility of the right-wing faction government in the 80s versus support for left-wing council at the time in the JL JLC what are the lessons we have from that time uh, of progressing trans rights um, and Nicola Martin's question is about what more can we do about transphobia today? Angela? Uh, uh, well, <laughs> well we, should, we have to oppose it. I mean, I think we got in a terrible mess over the Gender Recognition Act. I mean, it is, it's tragic that uh, it, um, the reforms that uh, were indicated, particularly self-declaration, um, haven't come about. So, but uh, we're not going to get there easily, I think. And there has to be, we have to create a context in which um, sections of the women's movement and the trans movement begin to learn together to, to listen and, and discuss and work out at least a minimal common uh, platform of actions. Um, transphobia absolutely has to be fought against. I mean, uh, I knew quite well uh, Rachel Pollock, who was uh, a prominent uh, trans woman in, in GLF. Indeed, she stayed with us for a uh, time and her partner, Edith. And, um, I always remember, I shall never forget walking up City Road with Rachel. And I have, so this is right back then, I have never sort of experienced such abuse and name calling and threats of physical violence just in a short walk up City Road to catch a bus. It was quite extraordinary. And this is obviously the stuff of experience 
of trans people then uh, and indeed now. And it's up to all of us. I mean, it's absolutely unacceptable. And we have to work together to find forms where we express the way in which that, that, is, that is unacceptable. But it does involve us, I think, getting out of getting out of corners and coming together, as we used to say. Perhaps that's, uh, I'd be interested in Jacob's um, observation on that. I was just going to say, you know, one of the things that we can do is, of course, support the organizations that are doing fantastic work in terms of um, trans rights and trans livelihoods today. So in the UK, for example, there's organizations like Gendered Intelligence and Mermaids who have been actively working to combat the quite um, uh, um, profuse misinformation that has been coming out um, and has been given platform uh, about uh, about trans people and trans life. I mean, Mermaids in particular has been really, really fantastic yeah. about pushing back against um, these various uh, claims around what, what trans inclusion might do uh, specifically for cis women and showing how actually um, the, the ways in which one would in, entrench trans affirmation within law, within policy, within society, is of course a form of combating these various forms of structural and inter interpersonal sexism and, uh, that are um, integral to um, uh, the claims that are being made. So I think the very basic thing that we can do, of course, is find the organizations that are doing the work already, right? This is a, a really key thing. We often think we have to be creating new organizations or doing, being, you know, instigating something, but there are already people and organizations that are doing the labor. They need your support. They need your donations, right? They need to know, uh, they need to have volunteers. So finding them and, and, and um, working with them and supporting them and giving them the platforms, absolutely necessary thing to do. And I think the other thing is kind of following up on what you've said there, Angela, which is, you know, one of the ways that transphobia is perpetuated in the contemporary UK right now is positioning trans people as new, right? Talking about them yeah. as this new, brand new thing that's popping up, that's causing a threat to contemporary life. And, um, and of course, part of what the GLF and your experience in it has shown is that there have been trans people, even if not under that same term, right, who have been around for decades. Um, and so this isn't a new thing. This is something that has been part and parcel of queer and trans life, of life in the UK, of life around the world. Um, and, uh, and so we need to be able to also tell those stories um, that push back on these, this misinformation and these lies that are being told about trans people in this contemporary moment. We need to be better and uh, have a better informed public about trans life. Um, because the things that are being uh, um, said in the media right now are just um, mostly vastly untrue, right? And maybe that then connects to some of the stuff that goes back to GLF in the early days around um, the way that gay and lesbian folks in that time um, and still today in many ways, um, their daily life was constituted by misinformation, fear mongering, right? So we can perhaps learn from some of those conversations um, and movements uh, to think about how we then- I think that's right. GLF didn't solve the trans problem, it must be said. I mean, it <laughs> remained a subject of great debate. Mm. It's interesting. Um, I went to um, a, um, a LGBT event um, a couple of years ago now, and uh, um, Theresa May was Prime Minister, and she appeared as the surprise guest. And the burden of her talk was that the government was supporting self-recognition of trans people. And it was central to her message then. And it got reasonable coverage in the press, as I recall. What's remarkable is the atmosphere has changed completely um, in Tory politics and wider just in the last two or three years. And that's, you know, a really interesting question why well, that's happened. Well, I think, I think, sorry, I think that is partly because we are divided and that's given this government the opportunity to renege on 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 Theresa May's uh, promises. In fact, mm. um, and that's what's happened, and they've got away. They're getting away with it. Mm. I mean, it is it is a, a political failure. No, there's a lot to be done, and I, I really Jacob's comments about 
existing organisations supporting people like gender intelligence um, and actually what more can local authorities do back to the question that Philip had posed actually this is where where all the institutions that exist have to stand up uh, and support uh, the trans community so as I promised I'm coming around to all four of you to give you a reason to be optimism from, uh, from memories of the GLF uh, so Jeffrey we'll start with you <laughs> Well, I'm always accused of being too optimistic, um, so I hope I am not um, a green in all this, but the, I go back to the 1980s, we mentioned Section 28, um, and the general atmosphere in the wake of AIDS, um, and the climate in the press, in popular prejudice against um, gays and lesbians was vitriolic, it was vile. Um, you know, if you look back at the papers of the time, uh, I think we'd all be shocked by how virulent it was. Now, it reminds me of the sort of virulence you see today in relationship, particularly to trans issues. My reason for optimism here is we did manage to resist that. It gave rise to Stonewall, to um, outrage. It gave way to the campaigns of the 1990s. And I don't think as part of the national discourse, it's possible today for senior politicians to say, say the same vile things that they did in the 80, 1980s. And that's what gives me some element of hope that if we go on affirming our positions, affirming um, the human rights issues, affirming um, solidarity with trans people, I think things could change. But it's not automatic. It's always a matter of popular struggle and the changing political conjuncture where other elements come into play. And that's a bit unforeseeable at the moment. But things have changed in the last 50 years, in the last 30 years, and I'm pretty sure things will change again. Angela next, because you're off mute, but then Gillian and Jacob. Okay, well, things actually do always change. <laughs> I mean, and it is extraordinary to think uh, that we, we, what we're talking about all happened 50 years ago, which is an awfully, awfully long time ago, as I was reminding my partner, who actually I met in GLF, so uh, we've been 50 years together. Um, what makes me hopeful? Um, well, I think... Um, People have changed. Uh, understanding has changed. I think there's the basis for greater solidarity between the heterosexual community, if you want to put it like that, and uh, LGBT plus uh, communities. I think there's a greater basis of the sort of solidarity that Huey Newton was saying was necessary for liberation uh, between uh, crucially BME people and ourselves. I think I have a certain uh, hope in young people. I've been enormously impressed by the um, involvement of young people in the new movement uh, around gender and sexuality. I think notions of fluidity and intersectionality are really important and get over some of the contradictions which we found quite difficult at various times to deal with. But I think um, that all has to be translated into political organization, which is actually quite difficult at the moment, because as I said earlier, a lot of our institutions that support liberty and support the rule of law are being attacked very directly. And um, so, uh, but uh, uh, my, my hope is, is, is young people. I think, I think they'll do it. Wonderful, Angela. Gillian. And um, well, GLF showed what could be done when uh, people came together and um, they're a real inspiration. And I think we should look to them really. For inspiration for the future. Brilliant Gillian and Jacob last but by no means least. Um, yeah I'll, I mean I'll be honest I'm having a hard time with optimism in the in these times but um, I think you know it's been really lovely to have this conversation and, and the thing that really um, that I've been thinking about a lot is how we are in really unknown 
times, right? We're in times where we're still, where the things are radically shifting and perhaps there's cracks there in the way in which we live that mean that other more radical articulations of what it means to provide care for one another, um, to be in, for, in relation with one another. I'm hoping that there's um, within those cracks, which are profound and quite devastating, that there's also the space for uh, intersectional, queer, trans, critical race organizations um, to, to flourish, to find new communities, to find new voice, and to begin to sort of patch up these cracks in ways that are radically different from the normative, boring, and harmful ways that we've attempted to repair things like that in the past. So that's my hope. <laughs> right on. <I> got... <laughs> <laughs> we did get there, Jacob, don't worry. We will be possible, we will win in the end. So thanks so much to our fantastic speakers. I'm utterly energized and activated by, uh, by, the fan by the fantastic thoughts I've heard tonight. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Gillian. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thanks to everyone who's attended for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us. And thank you to the audience um, for being fa fantastic and some wonderful questions. As always, thank you to the excellent LSE events team, to the LGBTQ steering group and Ben, who without this, much of this wouldn't have happened today. So thank you to all of them. What's more what's clear is there's a, a lot more for us LGBT plus community to do, but we owe a lot to the activists and campaigners who laid the grounds for this. In the words of GLF's slogan, gay is good. Now go and have a lovely evening. <laughs>